So welcome back at uh, ThingsCon 2016 and uh, um, we're doing a lot of interviews here with uh, people that are on stage doing talks, some people doing even two talks, like uh, our new guest here, so uh, who are you and uh, what do you do? Uh, my name is Usman Haq and I'm the CEO and founding partner of Umbrella, as well as another initiative called Thingful. Do explain. Well, Umbrellium is sort of an umbrella company that I created with some partners to do a range of projects to do with participation and empowering citizens through technology. Thinkful.net is one of our kind of spin-outs, basically our first spin-out, which is a search engine for the Internet of Things. And what we do with Thinkful is basically index all of the IoT resources that we can find around the world and just make it easier to access them and make use of them. Things that are already made public uh, to make it easier to find them. Probably born out of your own uh, itch. Yeah, very much so. Um, my first startup uh, was called Patch Bay, which back in the day was one of the kind of early IoT data services, if you like. And it was a generalized message bus and time series database for connected sensors in general. Um, that kind of grew and grew and grew and grew. Um, and what we realized around 2013 was there's now thousands of platforms just like that. You know, different cities have their own platform, different companies have their own platforms, there's open source initiatives, there are totally closed networks. But the promise of the Internet of Things is that somehow all this stuff is supposed to talk to each other, even across these walled gardens. And so we just thought, as a, as a kind of a first step, let's just start indexing all of these platforms and make it easy to find the stuff that's already out there. And as the low-hanging fruit, the public stuff, just make that easier to access. So for example, if you're concerned about air quality, and you want to find out where the nearest air quality monitor is, um, you can't just use a normal search engine to say, you know, where's the air quality monitor on my street? You know, Google will just give you a news report maybe about air quality which probably doesn't even relate to your street but maybe it relates to your city to find the device itself that your neighbor might have installed and actually you know they've made it public because they actively want to share that data um, is very difficult unless you happen to know that they are publishing it on the air quality egg platform so how did you do that how did you come up with the solution well what we did was we i mean we basically looked at the early days of the web and you know, and one of the first things to come out, this is before Google, of course, was Yahoo as this kind of somewhat manual directory of resources on the web. And we kind of did the same thing, which is that we said, okay, what are all the air quality networks that we know of? Okay, there's AQICN, there's Air Quality Egg, there's, you know, there's the, the Smart Citizen Kit has an air quality monitor on it. There are a lot of Arduinos that have air quality monitors on them now. Um, there are local governments and different smart city platforms that have air quality data on them. And then we repeated that for weather, for seismic data, for volcanoes, for ships, trains, cars, soil monitoring, water monitoring, all animals. Manual. Say again? All manual. Well, at first it was all manual, just going out and finding where those networks were. I mean, of course, having been in the industry for a while, I knew about a lot of them, but then actually going out out and actively looking for these networks and adding them basically to our crawler that crawls it on a regular basis. Um, we built a kind of a massively scalable generalized crawler where each time we discovered a new network it was relatively easy to add in um, the, the, new, uh, the, the new network's data format or data protocol or what have you. But the way it kind of transformed over time, it became something a little bit different which is that we realize that on the Internet of Things, actually, all of these separate networks, it makes sense, it makes a lot of sense. People want to protect their data, they want to take control of it, and even where they might be making it available to others, they're using a format or a protocol for a very particular reason, which in some cases might be very vertical specific. You know, if you're a building management system and you want to use BACnet, you know, why would you sort of wait for the IoT industry to converge on some standard which may or may not come uh, at some point? You're just going to use what, what, what you've got. Um, and so what we realized actually was that Thinkful was, yes, it's a search engine, but in a sense what it really is is a, is a discovery engine through which the owners of things 
can safely and securely make their stuff available to others, but not have to give away everything in the process. And so, so it turned into a platform, or, or, um, or no, it's a still a kind of thing. So it's still this kind of decentralized system where you use the search API to make a search, and you might say, um, "What are all the bicycle docks near to this geolocation?" And then there's an access API that where you can go out and access the data from an individual dock. Where what you do is you make an API request, and then we go straight to that original data source to get that data in real time. So there's no kind of platform that centralizes or aggregates the data. It's all decoupled so that you go out and get the data from the owner uh, uh, then and there. But where it gets really interesting is with private data. So, um, you know, take the connected car for example. There's of course lots of cliches for the connected car to do with, you know, insurance telematics and remote maintenance and all this kind of stuff. But there's a much more interesting side to the connected car, which is that the car itself is generating data that is valuable to others that will be willing to pay for it. For example, weather services. In the UK, the Met Office is, you know, it's the, um, it's the, the national weather service. They have weather stations every 20 kilometers, roughly. I mean, that's how far apart they're spread. And their business is selling, effectively, is selling weather um, forecasts. They're desperate to have much higher resolution data. Now, if they could get the connected car data uh, that might tell them about whether the wipers are on, or whether the headlights are on, or the fog lights, that data becomes a high, high resolution, real-time ground truth for their forecast. And they can massively improve their forecasting service. And so they'd like to be able to access that data. But of course, the car owner doesn't want to say, here's all my data, you know, do with it what, it, what you want. They want to be able to say, effectively, I have, my, my car data is available to certain parties. If they search for it, they can find it. But if they want to access it, then they have to make a separate request, which might be, you know, could be based on, look, I'll give you my fog light data if you give me a forecast for free. Or it might be, you know, pay for it, or it might be, no, I'm willing for you to do this because for the, for the you know, emergency planning or whatever, you know, it's good to have that fog data, or whatever. The point being that the owner has full control over that. And so in an Internet of Things world where everything is, you know, in its own platform, behind its own firewall, what we're really trying to do is enable owners to make that data available to each other safely and securely without just sort of having to use, you know, the, the old kind of Microsoft paradigm of permissions control, which is purely hierarchical and which is just not suited to the complexity of internet things. Especially these days, because a lot of people do not realize how many connected devices they might have, how much data they are gathering, and how much data they're already sharing without their consent. Uh, uh, and once confronted with it, uh, they might might even scare them and say, I, I never realized that I was already gathering all these data, get rid of it. That's right, yeah, and I think that especially as awareness grows about the sensitivity of private data, I mean, there's we can't say that there's a groundswell right now. It's not like people are knocking down doors saying, no, you can't access my data. Um, but I think that awareness is growing, and especially in the UK where um, you know they recently brought in this, uh, what's known as the Snoopers Charter. It's a new law that enables all sorts of surveillance by the, um, the, the government infrastructure, uh, except for politicians, by the way. I mean, you know, they, they handily excluded themselves from this. But as this is happening, and you know, there's actually now a movement that's mobilized, as a, there's been this petition that actually now requires government to respond to this, where people are saying, wait a second, no, you know, we don't just want to be uh, snooped on anytime. We want to have control of where our data goes. We want to be able to determine what happens to it and who makes you what use of it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I think that what we're planning for is not. It's, it's not something right now, but we're, you know, it's on, we're on the cusp of a change, a step change, I think, in this kind of connectivity of all these kind of billions of things, because there's already billions of things out there. And there is a step change coming, I think, whereby um, on the one hand, there are potentially massive problems because of all the security issues, uh, but there's also tremendous benefits um, once people have that ability to, to in a controlled way, enable their stuff to talk to each other. And it's not going to happen 
using the kind of, you know, not to bash IBM, but that kind of like centralizing approach of like, you know, just put it all into the Smarter Planet platform and we'll, we'll deal with it. Uh, every conversation I have with a, with a city manager or with a, you know, a data provider is that they want to have control of that data and where it goes and what happens to it and not be beholden to some sort of remote platform. So how, how does this work? I mean, is, is it consumer? I mean, uh, I'm collecting data, I suppose. Uh, uh, I've never thought about it. Uh, uh, there is one organization that is interested in my data. How, how, do, I, how, do, how do they approach me and, and how, do they, how do they find me? It, that, that's an interesting question. So, um, as a startup, you know, we, we, we're, we're trying to figure out our path along the way. And it's not like we have a complete solution that says, okay, here it is, and this is how it's going to be used. And so, one of the things we've been a little bit surprised about was that largely we've assumed that as a kind of an, a technology infrastructure, actually we will enable other people to build stuff on our infrastructure. And so it's really surprised us how many ordinary people go to the website and use the search engine and say, you know, where's the weather station near me, where's the air quality monitor near me, etc., etc. So the short answer to how, you know, how would an ordinary person use it is that the way they are using it, and actually using it quite a lot right now, is that, you know, they might say something like, because um, this is something you can do on thinkful.net, uh, I want to set up a watch list that will notify me every morning as I go to work about the weather, the traffic, and, you know, my, my, my neighbor's weather station, which is public, um, the traffic on my route to work, the number of bikes that are available in the shared bike here, and the number of docks that are available at my destination. Um, and they can kind of set all that up. Further along the way, though, and I think this is where it kind of gets more complex, but also more interesting. Um, the way we, we see this working, and this is something we've actually already built out as a fully functional system, but not, not production scale yet. Um, this was through a connected car grant that we got from Innovate UK, uh, in the UK. Um, the way it would actually work is that as a car owner, you would have some kind of an application, which is most likely on the mobile phone these days, um, and you set what we call entitlements on all of the data there. And there's a, there's a simple way to do this, but of course you can get, get down into the detail. And essentially what you're doing is you are deciding which bits of data are discoverable by third parties, not, not accessible, but just discoverable, and by what kind of third party. So you might say, okay, my average speed is discoverable by the, um, the road transport authority, right? Because they probably use that for maintenance purposes, something like that. Um, my fog light data is only available to commercial organizations, no one else. Um, my fuel consumption is available only to academics. That's all about discovery. Now, when, let's say, a... Just, just before you continue, but that, that, that sounds like an academic job almost. I mean, there's lots of data, lots of different kinds of uh, data, lots of organizations looking for this data. It's not a static thing, because new organizations pop up every time, uh, with new requests, etc., etc. Uh, a lot of people do not have got much idea about what these data um, mean, what, what this data means, and, uh, and what one could do with it, whether it could be harmful or not. So, it, yeah, it's, so it's easy to, to explain, but it's a difficult task. It's a very difficult task when it comes to the interface design itself. And that's not something that I think I'm, you know, I don't think we've totally solved that, that specific issue there. Um, the way I think it would work, though, and where I think it gets kind of even more interesting, I'm kind of like hopping forward in the future, if you like, but the principle of liquid democracy um, I'm kind of popping here a little bit, but in, in liquid democracy, the idea is that we vote on things that matter to us, but we don't necessarily vote on everything. And sometimes what we do is we couple our vote to the vote of somebody who's an expert in the thing that we worry about. So I might not know a whole lot of security, stuff about security, but I will vote for anything that Bruce Schneider votes for because he is an expert on, on security. That's the way liquid democracy works. And I see something quite possibly similar in the creation of these kinds of data entitlement preferences that on the one hand it needs to be kind of complex enough that anyone
can really go down into the details of exactly what is happening to it. On the other hand, it should be possible almost to kind of template your preferences according to the people that you trust, um, that you trust, not that the company tells you to trust if you see it. Um, and on that way, you could actually have a system where people don't need to get into all the details unless they particularly want to, but still are making that kind of crucial decision. Who is it that they actually trust uh, to, to set it? Does that make sense? It, it does. It does, it does, yes. Uh, uh, although I still think it, it's, it's a quite a different task. Uh, oh, yeah. You have at hand. Uh, uh, no. um, I'm not that easy. In, I'm not, not that interested in the easy tasks. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, but this was the first step, and you were moving on to the second step. And I'm not sure what that was. The second step, okay, so the first step is you set these kinds of discovery entitlements, which simply means that now when a commercial weather service is searching for, let's say, um, uh, fog light data in this region of the UK, they'll get back a list of all the cars who have said they're content to be found, but they still have to make a request to each of those cars to say, I need your fog light data and this is what I'm going to give you in return. So this can be either manual or automatic. You know, if it was automatic, it could actually be set up that they could say, I'm going to pay you this, mu this much for your fog light data, and then the, uh, the, the car itself could actually engage in a negotiation around that price. Or it could literally be something like, here's a coupon to use at the next rest stop, or something like that, you know, in return for your fog light data. But it's the separation of search from access that I think is the, is the crucial thing to kind of understand here. That, just because you're discoverable does not mean that you're accessible. So it's a kind of like a two-stage setting or decision-making that you can do to make sure that really that data is going where you think it is and where you have that ability to kind of follow a chain of accountability almost, if you see what I mean, uh, to who's making use of that data and what you're getting in return for it. But it's obviously a very important part of all uh, data and, and security and privacy and things like that. And, and um, I think that you've been around the IoT for, for a long time. I think uh, you, you were working on an IoT project before it was called IoT, I, I think. Um, has this changed over the years? Um, it's definitely changed. I mean, it, it's kind of interesting to me that when I, when I kicked off, the kind of work that was to do with networked urban environments and things. Um, I'm talking here about so around 2005, 2006, moving into 2008. Um, most of the conversation was in Europe, and there were conferences in Europe in 2008, 2009 about the Internet of Things, and there was nothing going on in the US at all. And I, I don't remember any kind of real discussions, whereas there were some EU meetings about the Internet of Things and social, political, privacy issues. The fact that, you know, it was only two years later, around 2011-12, almost the entire paradigm of IoT had been kind of captured by the US. I mean, I'm talking about the mindset for what the Internet of Things is. And I think that mindset was very engineering focused, whereas a lot of the, the, the conversations that had been going on before that were much more about the socio-political consequences of data, of standardization, of centralization versus decentralization. Suddenly it became, oh, this is about convenience, remote control, you know, I can switch on my, my door, uh, open my door, switch on my light at a distance, which for me was regressive. I mean, this was like a 1950s model of a remote control television. Um, but I think that that would be all part of this kind of like what I'd call the kind of first phase of the Internet of Things, which was, of course, everyone's trying to figure out what it is, what does it mean for stuff to be connected. Everyone's kind of creating these platforms for basically their own use. You know, you deploy a platform of connected sensors because you are going to make use of that sensor data. Or you would deploy a platform and you would sell a piece of hardware with it that would use that platform. I'm thinking or, like, or become the standard because that's usually yeah. Yeah, the, the, the winner takes all mentality that you see in every industry, uh, every digital right. industry. So I think there was a lot of companies that thought, okay, uh, this is going to be big. I want to be the standard platform technology that everybody's using. That's right. Uh, so the, the Internet of Things thing. But what's happened, of course, is that everyone. I mean, you know, Bosch has got a platform. You know, Rimfoss has got something. IBM's got one. 
AWS, Salesforce, blah, blah, blah. You know. And so what I'm seeing now, which I'd call the kind of phase two, is the kind of waking up to the reality that actually the data on any single platform it actually becomes much more valuable when it can interoperate with the data on other platforms. And so, I mean, this is not a massive movement yet. Right? It's not like everyone's crying out to, 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 to do this kind of thing, but very savvy companies and organizations are starting to say, oh, you know what? They have data that I could use coupled with my data where I could do better things with it. And so it's valuable to get hold of that data. Or, you know, or I have a lot of data and if only I had some kind of, you know, but it's d d uh, spread out, it's kind of disparate, a little bit like the, the net offices I was describing. If only I could get some of the citizen contributed data, I could actually start to make a, a, a much better forecast or what have you. And so what we're moving into now, I think, is that, that, that understanding that, that interoperability, and here I mean interoperability in a decentralized sense, not in the sense of, oh, we should all be using the same data format. What I'm seeing is actually interoperability in the sense of glue that binds things together, even though they're kind of using different formats and standards and protocols and even different authentication methods and, and what have you. So yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely constantly changing the, the IoT landscape. And this new happens to be your platform, I, I suppose? That's one of the things, yeah, that's certainly one of the things that, that you know, that's the, 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 the kind of the, the, the direction that we're trying to capitalize on. But we see it in other things, you know, just the use of, um, well, in the UK emerged this um, uh, something called Hypercat, which is a specification for platforms to catalog what resources are available on them. Um, there are, uh, there are, you know, a lot of platforms now have what are known as webhooks, which is basically you can kind of go out and ping remote services. IFTTT, for example, the, the consumer platform, um, is there to kind of glue stuff together, uh, and so yeah, I mean that's this is this is a slightly new phase, I think. So we're in in, in the second phase, uh, uh, but it still uh, feels a little bit bottom up. It still feels a little bit uh, solutions looking for problems. It still looks a bit like uh, techy, a little bit. Also, although there is a lot of designers here as well, it's really very mm -hmm. good to see at uh, the things from conference. So with, what is needed for the next step? Well, the really interesting thing that, I, that I'm seeing is that there was a lot of enthusiasm in the kind of early years for the smart city concept and many cities, I'm speaking here particularly about the UK, which I know better about, um, uh, many cities invested in some kind of smart city project and um, very few of them have actually delivered on anything because they were purely technology-led initiatives. You know, oh, we just need to wire up lots of sensors and then magic will happen somehow. Um, what, and of course, I mean, I understand early days in the industry that, that that sort of enthusiasm takes place. But of course, I think when you actually talk to city managers and to cities and to councils now, they're sort of actually saying, no, wait a second, what does this actually deliver for us, for our citizens, for our budgets? Because in the UK especially, and of course around the world, but um, notably in the UK, Every budget is being reduced. You know, they're looking for operational efficiency. They're looking to make sure their return on investment is secured. And I think those that are being more forward thinking are understanding that there are two opportunities here. One is that, of course, connected sensors, networked environments, networked urban environments can specifically have a role in, in just um, in dealing with operational efficiency. That, that's kind of been demonstrated. But the second thing is that when they actively include people, ordinary citizens, in the process, not just of consuming data, but actually generating data, measuring data, kind of creating hypotheses around data, deciding what they're going to do with it, and making decisions around it, actually people's investment in whatever has been deployed is longer and it's much more firm and actually they're they're you know to use the the, the the financial term their ROI is much better secured um, and so that's happening increasingly I think now I mean it's 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 
still the kind of more forward-thinking cities. I'm thinking of like places like Bristol, where a lot of this is happening in the UK. Um, that there's a kind of a two-pronged approach here. But yes, we need sort of basic network urban infrastructure for, for, for certain things. Our, our lorries should be able to communicate with the services back at the council, etc., etc. But the idea of involving citizens is not just a sort of touchy-feely, oh, isn't it great that everyone's involved? It's like, actually, this is the way that we make sure that we're delivering something with actual value that persists and has some kind of sustainability model going forward and not just a one-off um, you know, flash project. Right, well, it sounds like a brilliant uh, closing words. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Enjoyed it. <laughs>